Welcome back, everybody. Uh, we now have the privilege uh, to, to listen to Lorenzo Rosasco. Uh, he's got a lot of great titles. Some of those include uh, professorship at um, University of Genova in Italy, uh, working with uh, IIT, the Instituto Italiano di uh, Tecnologia, and I'm saying that terribly, <laughs> as well as uh, we're very lucky to have him when he comes and uh, works with us and teaches uh, at MIT as well. Um, doing things such as machine learning and other uh, great machine learning algorithms uh, and everything machine learning. He's the guy we go to. Anyway, without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Lorenzo and away you go. All right. Thanks, Chris and Gabriel. And uh, it's always a pleasure, I guess, not easier not to be, but at least to attend somehow uh, the BMM school. Okay. So, um, uh, I'm going to talk a bit about machine learning. Um, first of all, just in terms of logistics, uh, let me know if there is any delay or you cannot hear me fine. You should be able to ask questions anytime. So feel, please feel free to do it. Um, just interrupt me anytime. Um, so what I'm going to try to do today is just to spend a few slides, just giving you some of the coordinates of how to think about machine learning problem uh, from a theoretical point of view. There's going to be some notation, but also I'm going to try to be friendly to whoever has no idea what statistical learning is. So um, please, people that uh, are actually expert in statistical learning theory, uh, to be patient. Um, and then uh, in the second uh, part of the talk, I'm going to tell you about some developments of uh, classical ideas in a bit more modern way, particularly in uh, as the title suggests, and try to um, establish uh, provable um, algorithms, algorithms that are provably efficient so that they can achieve good results with minimal amount of computations. And then I'm going to go and show you some experiments, uh, some empirical results uh, in one particular case study, namely large scale kernel methods. All right, so um, I'm what I'm going to present is kind of uh, uh, ideas and uh, related to the work of a lot of people. And here I just mentioned some of my close collaborator. In particular, what I'm going to discuss today is related to work I've been doing over the years with Alessandro Rudi. Uh, and uh, particularly the work today is with Giacomo Meanti and Luigi, who are PhD students, uh, PhD student uh, in, uh, in Genova. All right, so uh, the basic idea here is that uh, uh, one motivation for this whole line of work is to model the idea that there are machine learning algorithms that works really well. And they typically are some kind of uh, technique that allows to uh, crunch data uh, using um, large scale computing uh, structures. And uh, um, perhaps the observation here is that uh, many, many, a lot of the development right now is uh, um, data hungry. You, uh, one ends up having a lot, a lot of, uh, um, a lot, a lot of uh, um, computations and energy required to do any kind of uh, processing. So uh, if something doesn't work, one adds layers, one adds more computation, using multiple GPUs and complicated architecture has become customary. So the one question is, how much do we actually really need to solve problem in an efficient way? Of course, one can tweak around solutions and try to go the empirical way. It would be nice to have some guidance that uh, tell us what's enough uh, and what does it mean to be to have the minimal um, amount of computation needed to achieve uh, the best possible results. So today we try to get some ideas that somewhat uh, make these uh, um, give you a framework to think about these kind of questions. All right, so um, the, basically, as I said, the first part is gonna be is really kind of a, a baby introduction to learning theory, okay? Mostly the questions, not really the proof techniques because that's somewhat uh, outside the, uh, it's a bit too long for, for a short talk like this one. And then I'm gonna discuss a bit the case study, which is basically simple uh, kernel methods, but in very large scale scenario, the idea to scale them up and I'm gonna show you some empirical results. All right, so this is a, a super simple, simplified uh, um, uh, picture of what learning is like in the supervised set. So we're given input and outputs. And what we would like to do is to make new predictions. So, uh, you know, this is super standard. The idea is that, for example, in classification, we might have some uh, 
elements belonging to two class. And we like to kind of find the decision boundary, but the main idea is that this decision boundary should work well, not only for, uh, for um, the points we have seen, but also for points that we have not seen, okay? So we should be able to predict well. And that's why here, the emphasis is on the fact that we need a function that will be able to predict well, not a data that we have already seen, but new data, okay? So this is a very simple idea, it's a basic idea, the idea that we learn from past data, how to predict new data. Uh, making this precise will require a bit of thinking because essentially we need to find a way to model uh, how our data are produced. Because in some sense, if we want the data from yesterday to be able to be useful for the future data, we need to have some kind of mechanism that relates the past data and the future data. So the basic idea of machine learning is assuming that there is some kind of probability distribution on the data. Okay, and that the data come from that in a, in a um, identical way. What this means is that every time we get a sample, and we're gonna take, we take an XY pair, it always comes from the same probability distribution. So we get N at the beginning, but then so we also assume that any new point, we want to test also come from the new probability distribution. In this sense, there is a, a, this idea that the data in the past will accumulate evidence towards making a, a prediction. I'm just using an iPad. Um, so, um, this is still uh, is going towards the direction of being precise, but it's not precise enough. We need to, we would like to see if we can uh, somewhat uh, explain what does it mean to have a function that works well, to have a solution to the learning problem that works well. And this will give us an ideal definition of the problem. So the way this is done is, uh, this we have already said, so we assume the data, okay, to come from a probability distribution. And then we say that a nice, a function will be good if it has small error on the test, if you wish, these are the new points okay so this is the expectation over any possible new points okay so if you wish this is kind of a, an idealization of a test error okay we want to test over all possible points in the future okay where points that are most likely to be sampled will have more importance okay so uh that's the basic idea uh and that's why this is a learning problem because we what we would like to do is to make this error small but we don't have a dispose of the true probability distribution. That's the key point. All we have is this data. So we do have this, okay? We do have this data, but we do not have the probability distribution. We assume it's given, it, it's, it's fixed, it's somewhere, but we don't have it, okay? Notice that in passing, I introduced a few, a few things. One in particular is this loss function. A loss function measures the error we make when we predict f of x, and then we reveal the true label, which is y, okay? So we're not trying to estimate the probability distribution per se, but we take more of a, what is sometimes called decision theoretic uh, point of view, which is when you try to actually make a, uh, take decision, okay? F is taking a decision in a probabilistic environment, so it will make mistakes, and so we need a way to estimate them. The classical example for the loss function, uh, for example, the square loss or the so-called um, logistic or cross entropy loss as it's trying to call it these days okay the loss function is uh, we assume it to be given it's part of the definition of the problem so we fix it we assume that there is a and we know it we assume that there is a fixed but unknown probability distribution and then we want to uh, predict well so if you want these slides is the central conceptual slides of the whole statistical learning theory uh, framework because it makes a modeling assumption and it defines the problem in a precise way. Given a probability distribution and the loss function, we would like to minimize the test error 
but all we have at disposal is the training set. Okay, so that's that's what we want to do. So clearly, we cannot directly minimize. You know, it's a minimization problem, but we cannot minimize it in a, in exact way because we do not have access to the test error. Okay? We only have a proxy for it. So the question we want to ask next is how we can go for trying to uh, find an approximate solution, try to learn uh, an empirical solution, and then how to uh, quantify how good or bad the solution is. Okay, so the basic idea here is that uh, what you're gonna do is that we are going to uh, replace the true risk with uh, these uh, uh, um, approximations. So we take the empirical average as an approximation of the true risk. Okay, so this is a, this is a very natural idea. So it's like a Monte Carlo estimate, if you wish, uh, of the true expectation. It's just empirical average that estimate the true expectation. And then we're gonna minimize this, but in order to be able to do it in, a, in a, any uh, meaningful numerical way, we need to uh, parameterize the functions, okay? We need the, this theta to be parameterized by some parameters that we can handle in some way. And so here I give you a few examples, okay? The, the basic one is uh, to assume to have uh, linear functions. So in this case, a function reduces to a vector, which is the number of degrees of freedom we have. Um, a related example, albeit much, much more general, is the case of kernels or features. And this is the case where we still consider uh, a linear function, but we pre-process the input, okay? By doing some, uh, um, we, we basically replace the original features with a new set of features, okay? Uh, the features could be nonlinear, okay? So uh, I'm assuming that many of you are familiar, but say if uh, uh, we could take, for example, if we have an input which is made of two components, we can map it and take now the square as well as the product of the components, okay? And we can keep on going, okay? So we take the data, we somewhat make some, no, we take out features in a nonlinear way and then we linearly combine them. Okay. So this is the standard way, uh, or let's say one standard simple way to build the nonlinear functions that are still linearly parameterized. And then the last way, um, is uh, uh, basically what is done in neural networks. The idea here is that uh, um, the features will be themselves parameterized. So the main novelty here is that uh, you, you can view this as a feature, but this feature depend on some uh, uh, parameter, okay? So the set of uh, parameter is now uh, uh, a coefficient as before, but also this set of coefficients that parameterize the feature. So these are the three main and most famous example of functions that one consider when dealing with uh, uh, actual estimation of fun functions. So there are many, many examples, but these actually cover most, by specializing this network, this uh, setting, you can actually cover most examples, okay? Uh, so again, the idea here is that I would like to minimize the test error. I cannot do it. I cannot really do it directly. So what I'm going to do is that instead uh, I'm going to um, I'm going to uh, minimize an empirical average. But in order to make this efficient, I need to parameterize my space of functions. Okay. Uh, it is often the case that further constraints are put on these space of functions. And for example. What is done is that some kind of weight, what is called weight constraint is considered, for example, in the form of some bound on the norm of the weights, okay? So here I'm vague about which norm. There are many, many possible choices, L2 norm, L1 norm, some of the absolute value of the coefficients, uh, various kind of matrix norm in the case of neural networks and so on. The basic idea that we might add uh, some kind of constraints. And at this level of discussion, 
uh, um, it doesn't really matter. The kind of reasoning we want to do is common from all these kind of uh, methods, okay? Uh, there was a question of which was uh, whether I should put a two here. It doesn't really matter because uh, it is just a rescaling. Uh, so the question I should have put a two here. It doesn't really matter. It's just a rescaling. Uh, one is uh, uh, theta in front of everything. You will learn the rescaling automatically. So the important thing here is to build um, uh, is to build uh, uh, the nonlinear features. Okay. Um, somebody else is asking if kernels are handcrafted or you need, so you need no domain expert to guess a good one for the problem at end. The short answer is yes. Um, it's a, if you want, uh, there is a, the, the, since they are quite a uh, uh, neat mathematical object, there are many different theories to build different kinds of kernels, depending on the kind of data you have, but still you need to work within, um, you don't learn them, okay? You, you typically only mild, mildly parameterize them. So the typical, that's, that's somewhat the, in my view, the crossing point between say, what you might call kernels or what you might call neural networks, how many parameters you have in your phi expression. So to some extent, we, we, when I talk about kernels, I assume that phi, the features will only depend on very few parameters, okay? Um, okay, so uh, notice that uh, um, once I have this, uh, one, once I set up this framework, I have data, okay? I have uh, some kind of uh, um, parameterization, I have some kind of weight constraints, and this produces, okay, this whole machinery will produce some function that will depend on the data and then will depend on the parameter if I choose this parameter, uh, this weight constraint parameter, it will depend on the uh, weight constraint parameter too, okay? And the question we want to ask is, uh, how well will this work, okay? Of course, you can tackle this question empirically. You will have to choose a specific problem, a specific data set, a specific loss, a specific class of function. You go in and try. But then the question is if the model we assume so far allows us to draw some general conclusion of our, this idea, okay? And here I want to tell you a bit how this is done. Uh, the key idea is that uh, what we would like to do is to uh, have, again, go back to the original question, which was not small empirical error, but small test error. And so then the idea become uh, uh, the following. To measure how good is the ERM solution, okay, F hat R, what we are going to do is that we are going to do the following. We compare This is the test error of ERM, of empirical risk minimization, okay? And uh, this is the best possible Test error, okay? So of course you cannot really do this in practice, okay? But th th this is where theory kicks in. Is you would like to try to draw some conclusion even though you don't have access to this kind of stuff. All right, so I put uh, everything in quotation marks, test error in quotation marks because this is not quite the test error, it's an it is an idealized version of the test error as if you had access to infinite data, okay? Uh, so this is the kind of quantity we like to study. And the problem is that you don't have really an analytic way to study them, you know, an obvious way to study them uh, because uh, um, the true distribution is not known, okay? So here I'm gonna show you the basic ideas of how you try to drive some kind of uh, conclusion about the behavior of this error and also ask the question of how do you choose The parameter r. In practice, you will have to tune it. There are this is the, these hyperparameters that you have to tune your algorithm, and it would be nice if theory would suggest how to do it. So, in order to do is the basic idea is that it's useful to introduce. This is the classical way to do it. We introduce an idealized version of ERM 
this is a, an ideal object to relate ERM and the best possible test error. I call it FR. This is the solution of empirical risk as if I had access to infinite data, okay? It idealized in this sense. So is ERM with infinite data. But I still consider weight constraints, okay? So I don't have access to all the possible set of solution. I consider only my set of possible solutions potentially with weight constraint, okay? And then here is what I do. So notice that this, this quantity doesn't depend on the data because now I have infinite data. So this is what they call FR. Sorry for the notation. So here, notice that F hat, F R hat is the empirical risk. Let's call this I ERM, idealized ERM. So this is the idealized ERM. And this is the idealized ERM and this is the best, okay? So notice that these quantities, now I, I want to look at these first two terms separately, okay? I want to look at this term and I want to look at this term. The second term, doesn't depend on the data. It's just the price I pay by basically don't allowing myself to explore the whole space. And this is what is called a bias term, okay? It's not exactly the classical bias term in statistics, but plays an analogous role, okay? So I call it a bias term, with a little bit of abuse of terminology, you might want to call it an approximation error. Uh, it will not depend, it will not be a stochastic quantity, it will not be a probabilistic quantity, a random variable, but it will depend on the true distribution, okay? Uh, the other term is the difference between essentially having access to infinite data or having access to finite data. Clearly this depends on the data, is a stochastic quantity, and essentially it plays the role of classically what is sometimes called the variance, okay? And again, here is not a variance in a classical sense. It's not in any precise sense. It's sometimes a better name is maybe the estimation error. I call it the variance because it will play the same role of the variance in a classical statistical analysis, okay? So, uh, now, what's happened then is that this quantity, then these two terms separately, we somewhat uh, um, decouple the probabilistic part and the deterministic part. And what we can do is that there are a bunch of different techniques that you can use to analyze them, okay? And uh, uh, I cannot go into any detail on how you, how you actually do it. But what I want to give you is an idea of the kind of stuff you get, okay? So this is a typical bound, okay? A typical bound is, uh, this is the bound on the variance. This is the bound of the bias. Okay, and let's see how they behave. The idea here is that for fixed amount of points, the uh, if you plot now the error as a function, the variance as a function of the uh, weight constraint, when you release the weight constraint, when you make it large, the variance will uh, increase, okay? Whereas when you let the weight constraints become less important, then the difference between these two terms will be less and this goes down, okay? Uh, again, proving this requires uh, some work and a mix between approximation techniques analytic techniques and the probabilistic statistical tools, okay? Um, once you have a bound like this, then you can uh, uh, somewhat optimize it. And then you can basically show that in this case, the best thing is to show it's an exercise. You can do it offline. You can just take this 
uh, best possible complexity, which is the trade-off between the bias and the variance. And then what you can check is that given this choice, you get this error, okay? Uh, so I imagine that many of you are familiar with this. This is a very classical picture, okay? And uh, uh, that actually recently draws, uh, drew uh, a large number of, uh, um, of uh, comments and, uh, and uh, um, the, you know, uh, critical uh, reviews, okay? Uh, and uh, we want to tackle some of these questions, okay? So, he, the, but let me just uh, maybe summarize a bit the step because we took three steps, okay? From the basic cartoon view of machine learning, we introduced the statistical learning setting where we formalize what we mean by test error and expectation of a, of a loss over distribution. Then we replace this test error with an empirical error that we can optimize over some class of functions. And then we ask how well this estimator will work. We introduce this difference between the test error of the, our estimator and the best possible test error, and we split it in these two contributions, okay? Uh, now, this is an idealized version, and I'm gonna stick to it, but I want to mention that there are a lot of simplification going here so that you have to somewhat take this picture with a grain of salt, okay? So in general, to get these bounds, you have to make assumptions on the problem at hand, which are not verifiable. Okay, so this is much, you know, science, you make assumption, you try to see if you can develop a theory which is predictive. In this case, this is one of the bounds you can get, okay? And the exact behavior of uh, the bias and variance might change. For example, uh, there could be, you know, power here. There could be an alpha here, and there could be a beta here. This will depend on the problem at end, okay? More generally, we might have to replace this with some function of r and some other function of v of uh, sorry the number of points and the radius so the exact behavior is not clear they might have a very very different uh, behavior okay um now the uh The point is that, again, the, the main point of this story is that it's not easy. It's not easy to uh, uh, know a priori. It's in fact impossible to know a priori uh, um, which uh, result, uh, which uh, assumption will lead to predictive assumption. But what you can do is to develop a theory that will work under different assumptions, okay? And uh, uh, for example, there is no reason to believe that they will both have, say, the kind of behavior, say, polynomial behavior, okay? You could have that one of the two terms dominates the other, okay? And so uh, I, I will stick to the simple bound that I showed before, but you should remember that the bounds depend on P. And so much better, worse, or even just different bounds are possible, okay? The other point is that uh, here, I'm just giving a, a, a very generic perspective, but there are many possible bounds that can be specialized to specific situations. For example, classification, okay? Classification is special because typically we don't really care about the cross entropy error, we care about the um, misclassification error, the, num the number of errors, and then the picture changes a bit. Or we might be in a situation where data are not so many and high demand, and they are in high dimension. And then it's very easy to fit them exactly, okay? What is this day is called um, interpolation or benign overfitting, okay? So in all this setting, one needs to develop uh, um, an ad hoc theory, specializing the ideas or developing the ideas that we discussed so far. But this is not what we're gonna do, but this is just what I call here, take all this with a grain of salt. John Ters take this as written in stone, is the bound, is a bound and there's some assumption, and it just gives us some qualitative information that might be changed under some other assumption, okay? Uh, so a question here is how you can, uh, where you can get the more um, information about these bounds. I, I think, for example, if you go and look at the 9520 course that I've been co-teaching with uh, Tommy and Sasha Rackley in the last few years, you can look at the reference there, there are many good references, there are books, there are a lot of good classes where you can fill in the gaps of my uh, presentation today. 
what I want to discuss today is uh, uh, the somewhat uh, the total lack of uh, optimization computational aspects in the discussion so far. So I haven't talked about uh, 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 computations at all. Okay. So as you uh, probably know, what you typically do in practice is that you have to solve this empirical risk minimization problem. Okay. And so what you do is that you often look at some some kind of uh, gradient technique, okay, say stochastic gradient, gradient descent, and so on, which means that in the end, you, do, you really never have access to this. What you have is the set of parameters that you compute with some degrees of approximation. And so at this point, what you really see is that you don't really know. You, know, you cannot always assume that this error is negligible, okay? And you actually need to know, you can ask how much computation I need before it becomes negligible. So in this sense, what you have to look at is the test error at, of what you can really compute, okay? Which is what comes out of your optimization problem. And again, you can compare it to the best possible error. What you have now is that you have the same terms you had before. You can now add and subtract the true exact empirical risk and then you have the same area you had before. This is just the ERM error. And then you have these two, this new term, which is what you might want to call the computational error. Notice that this is not the, the standard error. This is the computational test error. Okay, so it's the test error that you will make on future data, not on past data. This is very different to what you do when you do um, when you do optimization. Okay, uh, typically in that case, what you try to optimize and to have guarantees on is just uh, are just empirical quantities. Okay, here what you want to compare are test error, and so in this view, the idea is that you would like to now you you, you know, of course you can split again the empirical error in the bias, which is deterministic variance, which accounts for uh, noise and sampling, and then you have computations. Now, if you take all these terms into account, and I think Tommy must have talked about this, the fact that you have all these different contributions to the error, you can now ask what is the minimal amount of computation in order to achieve the same accuracy you would achieve here. When in turn, what is the maximum, if you fix the level of computation, which is the best possible error you can achieve, okay? You can, uh, you know, in, in a regime where you have a lot of data, the computation might be the bottleneck, okay? And you can go in and try to see what is the interplay within these different terms. Uh, so I, I think this, this is basically what I wanted to give you as a general discussion. This basic idea that is classical statistical learning, one split the error with two basic contribution, which accounts for statistical, you know, probabilistic uh, source of error and deterministic source of errors when we start to put constraints on the problem. But on the other hand, in, in modern views of machine learning, there are other source of error and optimization is the main one. And then this creates a trade-off between many different terms that one has some amount to balance, okay? And of course, this is just the tip of the iceberg because you might want to consider more specific form of error. For example, communication errors among devices, okay? Or privacy requirements. All these different requirements will be other uh, requests, other requirements that you have to square out with the, the classical bias variance trade-off, okay? So the idea is that uh, if you want to try to look at not only uh, sample efficiency, but also computational efficiency, you have to need a, you need a language, you need a framework to be able to ask questions. And here, uh, this is just a, a, a peek into how people look um, into balance out statistical and computational requirements. So maybe I'll take a, a one minute break here to just see if there are any questions. What I want to do next, uh, why you think we have any curiosity is to look at how we can develop this idea. And I want to give you one specific example uh, where we actually try to uh, really check if we could improve and try to get the best possible computations. And then I show you that uh, uh, indeed we got something that gives some interesting practical results.
let's go on a bit. I, I just want to show you how we've been, uh, you know, thinking a bit about these kind of ideas in the specific setting where we um, we consider least squares. And rather than constraining, we actually uh, did what is sometimes called the Lagrangian formulation. So rather than putting uh, a constraint on the norm of theta, we actually move the constraint uh, as a penalty in the function. And so the role of R is now played by lambda, okay? Or if you wish, one over R is lambda, okay? So big lambda means that I'm constraining the model a lot, small lambda means that I'm putting no constraint. And uh, what I'm gonna tell you uh, worked for linear models. So it will not be a neural network story. It will be a, a story for linear models and in particular for kernel models. So these are, as I said before, feature models, okay? And there could be cases where um, you can uh, um, have situation where phi is not just a vector, but actually will have infinitely many features, okay? And uh, uh, it turns out that it's still possible to handle this kind of uh, models as long as we have a good expression for this, okay? Notice that this is just when I write the inner product in components, it's just a series, okay? And we do know that the infinite sum might converge to finite uh, numbers and uh, um, in, to, you know, to, to finite expression. And this is basically what kernels are. Our, our particular example, when you have features that even if they're infinitely many, they still give a, a, a inner product that it can be uh, computed well, okay? And here example abound, you know, among many perhaps, um, the classical example of kernel is the Gaussian kernel, okay? Which will not correspond to um, finitely many features, but only to infinitely many features. And again, if you go and check uh, resources for NIFEC 20, I developed this calculation is a small exercise. It doesn't take a long time. Um, so this is the setting I want to consider. So there is a question by Cole, why is the word kernel used to mean so many different things? Yeah, you're right. Yeah, so, um, so I guess uh, in this case, I call it kernel, but the, the full name is reproducing kernel and it comes from the theory of so-called reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces. Uh, is indeed different from when you call kernel to denote the null space of a matrix or an operator and it's still different from, it's actually not so different, it turns out to be very much related to the notion of kernel that one uses in convolution, okay? Uh, in fact, those two are, are pretty much the same thing. Okay. If you think when you do, for example, convolution and you do blurring, you exactly use a Gaussian-like uh, uh, kernel. Okay, uh, so the the convolution and the and this reproducing kernel business are related. It really has not much to do, or I'd say, nothing to do with the, uh, determining linear algebra. Uh, so this is you know my best shot at this. Okay. Uh, then Ferdinand is asking, why is the Gaussian kernel so widespread? It doesn't look simple. It is actually quite simple in the sense that it's easy to compute. It, it, uh, uh, it's just a distance on top of an exponential. It doesn't require any dedicated computation. By tuning the, the, this width, you, I mean, maybe, you know, just, uh, just because this is a course, no, oh, forget it, too much. So basically by, by tuning the width, by tuning this parameter here, you can go from combination of very wide Gaussians, very wide mountains to very peak mountains. And you can go from very simple functions to very complicated functions. So in that sense, uh, um, people like it because it's, uh, it's, it doesn't contain a lot of prior information, but uh, it interpolates well between complicated and simple functions. So Patrick is asking, can you give me some intuition about the reproducing property of the kernel? What does it mean? No, that's, a, that's a, I'd be happy to do it and to point you to many resources to do it, but it's like, you know, it's, 
it's it's a huge mountain and here i carefully avoided it because uh, it, it takes too long um let's say that there is a, a this thing that i just swept under the rug the fact that you can somewhat let this p go to infinity uh, can be made precise and made into a very beautiful piece of theory uh, but this is requires a bit more than the time i have now okay but i'm happy to to point you to what for example you know uh, in, in again in the in the MIT course, I think it's on you. Everything is on YouTube, and the slides are available on the website. You find both the friendly introduction and the not so friendly introduction. Okay, so um, let's move on a bit. Uh, I want to show you. Okay, what happens when you study these kind of things? It's very similar to before. Essentially, lambda replace r. You can get a bound of this form that tells you that if you choose lambda this way, you get a kind of errors and you can show that this error is actually pretty good okay uh, it turns out that to solve this problem and again for this will be uh, old news for those of you you know uh, what you have to do is that you have to solve a linear system okay and i won't say exactly what is this linear system but i will tell you that this will is typically uh, inverting a matrix solving a linear system phi by a matrix which is n by n okay so this means that when you get this kind of bounds, you're gonna use an algorithm that is gonna to have to solve the linear system. And so in the naive, if you just use a naive direct solver, this is gonna require a cubic time and a quadratic memory. Now, this you can improve in a bunch of ways, but it's kind of worst case complexity, these are fine. Now, it turns out that statistically, the, you, under the, you know, basically, you, the only way to improve this is to add assumption. You can ask yourself whether you can make this better. And if you can show, in this case, we are basically assuming that we computed this in closed form. You can now ask if I can now do approximate computation that are still precise enough to get this same error, okay? And that's what I want to show you next. Again, here, I'm not going to go into details, but I just want to show you some a basic idea. The first idea is, again, you have to solve a linear system. Again, I'm not writing it precisely because this is just because it is least square. So I'm just assuming that you know what least squares is. And basically, what you want to do is stay away from direct solvers. So you want to use gradient techniques and fast gradient techniques. And for example, you know, conjugate gradient turns out to be a good choice in this setting. And then you, what you want to do is that you want to use sketching or what is sometimes called column subsampling. What's the idea here? Rather than solving this whole linear system, what we're gonna do is that we're gonna select at random certain columns, okay? So that effectively now all we have to solve is a smaller linear system that comprises the column that we have sampled. So we still have the whole data, okay? We still have the whole training set points, but we only use a subset of their columns and we still use all the output data. That's the basic idea, okay? This is, for those of you who are familiar with it, this is related to so-called Johnson Lindstrom's lemma, but this is kind of an incarnation of Johnson Lindstrom, not to preserve distances, but to try to solve linear systems. Okay, so this is uh, this is the kind of trick that you can do. And now the idea is that we want to analyze, and then there is some more trick like preconditioning, but uh, this is not so important. So at this point, what you can do is that you can go in and check. Uh, how much computation you need, you can analyze this and check what is the interplay between computation and statistics. So here, let me call M the number of columns that we sampled, okay? So we're gonna have the number of iterations that I call T. So I don't solve the problem exactly. I do T iterations. And also I don't do, I don't really solve the whole linear system. I only choose solve this reduced linear system where I sampled 
m columns, okay? So what I want to know is if there is a theory that tells me how to pick m and t in order to get the same exact error that I was achieving before without with, with these much heavier computations. And this is basically what you can do. So you can do a theory that somewhat study here, again, is the same trick as before. We want to analyze the behavior of the, this approximate algorithm. We are gonna have on one hand, the same error we had before, but then we have the contribution of this new error. And this will depend on the, the amount of subsampling we do and the amount of iterations we do, okay? Once we have all this thing, we can put it all together. And what you can see is that basically with the amount of um, columns, which is order of the square root of n, and the number of iteration, which is essentially logarithmic in n, we get the exact same error as if you solve the linear system directly. Okay, so you don't lose anything at all. Again, remember that this is just a reference bound, okay? Uh, so this is an example of, the, again, I'm, I'm glossing over a lot of details, okay? But I just want to show you a case where you can ask the question about what is the interplay between optimization and statistics, and you can try to devise precise bounds that gives you somewhat an indication of what is the interplay, okay? Uh, so there is a question in which term could we fit overfitting in this theory, maybe in the relation to variance and computation? Yes, I think it's mostly in the variance term, okay? But truly is in their play, is the interplay between variance and computation as you're saying, okay? Again, and then it depends a lot on the kind of assumption and setting, okay? So again, here I just want to show you an example of how it is possible to quantify exactly the amount of computation you need to get a certain statistical bounds. The same grain of salt I asked you to keep in mind before still holds. This bound is not the bound, it's a bound that is taken, considered under some assumptions for a setting. So you might, if you're in the interpolation regime or in the classification regime, if you have, widely separable data, uh, you might get very different behavior, okay? You will have some, you will still use similar ideas, but you will have to develop them again, okay? And there is a lot of room to try to develop scientific theory that uh, somewhat twist these uh, generic ideas into specific setting and try to see if they are predicted. Okay, so this was the second part of what I wanted to show you, which is a bit more of a statistic uh, research direction, okay? And this is this, this, this thing I described here, this set of ideas is this algorithm that we call Falcon for no particular reason. And it can be seen as a solver for essentially uh, large scale kernel methods, okay? And what I want to give you a sense is how this thing work, okay? So I'm a bit uh, behind schedule, so let me, let me, just uh, uh, give you the results of uh, uh, the latest implementation we have, which is a GPU optimized implementation where we use a lot of tricks from scientific computing. They just give you a sense of uh, um, how these things scale, okay? So I think the bottom line is that uh, there are a lot of problems where one doesn't even try kernel methods because you cannot run them. The classical folk wisdom is that once you get to 30,000 points, 50,000 points, you just cannot run an SVM-like algorithm. And if you just go on scikit-learn and you download an SVM, that's pretty much the case, okay? There are uh, library available that allows to scale it a bit more, okay? For example, this uh, Thunder SVM is one of the latest optimized SVM implementation. And you see, you can go up to um, 10,000, you know, 60,000 points, Okay, and a few dimension, okay? These are quite big dimension already. And what you see is that this implementation can actually run pretty fast, okay? In 20 seconds, 80 seconds, you have solutions. Notice that our, our, our algorithm consistently goes down to essentially order of 10 seconds, okay? But we're still in the same uh, rough uh, dimension, okay? This, uh, what I want to show you now is a bit bigger data sets and perhaps the most fun one is this one. This is a billion point, okay? 
And the dimension is order of tens, so it's not huge. But you can essentially run the algorithm in, uh, on one GPU in one hour, okay? So you, you have solvers that can run a billion point. It can run essentially an SVM-like algorithm achieving best possible accuracy known up to now and run it in one hour, okay? And these are all data sets that I'm showing you here are pretty much like data sets that are pears and apples. What they have in common is that they're all number of points, order of millions. So this is a billion. This is 11 millions, okay? This is a million, but with a very high dimensional, although sparse um, input space. This is a million, a million, a million, a million, a million. And if you look, this is the biggest, okay? You can run an SVM on 11 million points in seven minutes, okay? This is a bit higher dimension. You can run it in 16 minutes, four minutes, half a minute, half a minute, a minute, three minutes. So this is just to show you how this is not just pure theory. It actually suggests how to develop fast algorithm. And essentially, uh, I, would, I want to mention here the work by Misha Belkin, among others, because this is something that we've been uh, going back and forth uh, in the last few years. In the last few years, we were able to develop techniques that scale kernel methods to millions and billions of points, and you can run them in, in a, you know, relatively cheap hardware, okay? Just one GPU, one desktop with one GPU in minutes. And this doesn't mean that you, you, know, you can toss away your deep learning network, but it just means that you have an alternative that you can play with while you wait for your GPU, multi-GPU AWS computation to finish, okay? Uh, up to a few years ago, we just didn't have it. We just didn't have anything like an SVM that you can run in very few minutes. And, uh, okay, I want to stop here. There are a few more things. There is a question I want to take for uh, Shreya, say, for computer vision data science, we often use PCSVD for subassembly. How is Falcon different from them? So Falcon is an SVM, is not a PCA. We use something like PCA before Falcon, but we use this random sampling I described before because it's much cheaper than PCA. So for PCA, we have to first do a very heavy computation and then we reduce dimension. Here we just subsample columns at random, so it's much cheaper, it's basically free, okay, compared to PCA. And then we run an SVM like thing on top of this dimensionality reduction, you know, uh, reduced dimensionality data set. So I think that's the basic difference. Um, hope this answered the question. So let, let me just uh, wrap up and then I take all the questions. Um, I guess the main point I wanted to try to say is that uh, a way towards efficiency is don't separate, do a theory that takes into account optimization and statistics and approximation all at once, okay? Here I just show you some basic idea, but this can be made precise and rigorous and be extended beyond supervised learning and uh, beyond statistical learning. For example, in online learning, sequential prediction setting and bandwidth setting. I want to, I emphasize several times that these are just some bounds but then we would really, if you want to be scientific about machine learning, we have to take this basic idea and specialize them to many different settings of interest. Classification, easy classification, high dimensional points, low dimensional points, certain kind of kernels, easy problems, hard problems. There is much work to be done there. And of course, there is a quest of trying to uh, scale this stuff even more and uh, going multi-scale is one way to go. All right, so uh, in the slide that I'm gonna share, there is a bunch of references, so you can look at that for further details. Uh, I'm done, I'm also late as usual. Let me take a, a cold question, and if there is anything else, uh, please type it up. So Cole is asking the expression you gave for F corresponding applies to linear regression. So the one I gave at the very beginning, yes. Uh, so they were literally, linear regression, something like an SVM and neural network. The second part of the discussion is essentially for SVM, uh, linear or not. So Dari is asking about uh, what about pruning and connectivity and sparsity. Uh, so he's asking if this question is inside the theory of not. The one that we develop and I show you, it's not. Uh, can this question be asked within this framework? I think so. That's exactly what I want to try to convey, that this is one rigorous 
uh, you know, available framework to ask these kind of questions. One would have to go in and see the interplay between pruning and sparsity and uh, um, its statistical effect on the test error. In sparsity per se, there is a lot of work. Is I think is when you start to go to deep networks and maybe to look at pruning, then there is a and that's much more, uh, you know, open. In terms of learning theory, what ideas do you think are most exciting in terms of explaining the success of deep learning? Um, so, at, at, okay, near tangent kernels, I think no, probably at this point, it's I, I haven't seen any evidence that he actually can explain deep learning. I think um, I think this this setting where you have so few points. So it, I think there is a setting that you know there is all idea of that being put forward by interpolation or benign overfitting. This idea that you, you can plot uh, fit the data well. There is this one setting where points are far away enough that. Uh, their distance is large enough, okay, that the distance matrix is invertible. Uh, this is an interesting setting that people didn't study much. So I think this interpolation setting is uh, quite interesting. I think the interesting bit is that a lot of things, Tim, we don't even understand it. It's, it's a model scenario that was not studied too well, even for simple model like linear models. So we don't have to dive in straight away into deep learning. Uh, we can, uh, you know, there are a lot of things that uh, deep learning pointed at that are even not clear in simple setting like linear models. I think interpolation is one such case. Um, there is a, um, there is this whole idea of basically keeping into account computations. Uh, this idea of what is sometimes called uh, implicit regularization. So the it's kind of same of what we're doing here. Try to keep in mind the effect of optimization on the learning and see how optimization can bias the search for a solution. Uh, to me, I think the, the most uh, uh, you know, open things that uh, I, I have seen very little probably in the last few years is the whole idea of understanding the role of compositionality and convolutions, which seems to be uh, one of the key ingredients, really. Um, I think that's, uh, that's maybe the one direction which I, where I've seen uh, less progress overall. I think there are some indication, uh, Tommy uh, discussed probably, you know, approximation results that are quite interesting, but uh, I think it's a bit more open in that direction and I don't know what is the best way forward. So AJ is asking, uh, what could be possible reason for non gradient descent methods not being so popular, their theory about the performance? Um, no, it's, I think it's a practical reason. Gradient descent can be, um, typically it can be computed just through uh, uh, matrix vector multiplications. And so it becomes extremely cheap, parallelizable, and you know, uh, easy to exploit uh, parallel uh, architecture. Uh, if you can allow yourself uh, an interpoint point method or, or anything, or, or a closed form solution is much faster oftentimes. Uh, but in many cases, in large scale problems, uh, gradient descent methods become uh, one of the only, maybe the only feasible solution because they're cheap and only requires uh, vector multiplications. 